Good afternoon and welcome to our daily COVID-9 update for the town of Plymouth. This is update number 49 and it's coming to you live on Wednesday, May 20th, 2020. I'm Steve Trifletti, your Plymouth Town Moderator, and we've been here this week each day, Monday through Thursday at noon for this update. This forum is being brought to you live by PAC TV on Comcast channels 13 and 15 and Verizon channels 43 and 47. You can also watch this on PAC TV's streaming channel by going to pactv.org slash live. Today, for questions during the forum, please email us to plymouthinfo at pactv.org. These forums can also be replayed at pactv.org slash Plymouth. Today's participants include Kenneth Tavares, Matthew Muratori, and also each Wednesday we're joined by Heather Cosby, Plymouth CPA, Amy Naples, Executive Director, Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce, Michael Jackman, he's on staff with Congressman Bill Keating's office, and Dr. Mark Wilson, he is a Professor Emeritus and the Department of Epidemiology. And at this time, we're going to go to the Chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen, Kenneth Tavares. Welcome, Ken. Good everyone. A uh, couple of things that have happened since we last uh, met, and that is that the Senate election was held yesterday, and Sue Moran uh, was elected uh, our new senator. Uh, we look forward to uh, working with her as soon as she takes the oath, and uh, appreciate the work of uh, our two representatives, uh, Muratori and Lanatra, for keeping us uh, up to date on Beacon Hill and trying to do two sides of, uh, of the house uh, with getting information for Plymouth. We appreciate it uh, very much. Also tonight, the Board of Selectmen will be meeting at five o'clock. There are just two items on the docket. It's to talk about parking at Whitehorse Beach and some proposed changes, as well as an up-to-date uh, report on uh, what will be open or have limited uh, uh, availability for the uh, recreational areas of the town as well as Plymouth Beach. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, and that's Kenneth Tavares, and he is the chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen. Each day we date stamp these forums in order that you will know whether they are live, and this is coming to you live in the top right-hand corner on May 20th. And at this time, we welcome back Dr. Mark Wilson. Welcome, Mark. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, as I've done previously, I thought I'd start with some questions that have arisen um, during the past week. Um, and <clears throat> the first one is, there's been a lot of discussion on TV about the number of tests being done and what percentage of tests are positive. Can you explain what this means and why it is important? So let's remember that uh, most tests that are being done now are, are going to tell us the presence of the virus. It's evidence that indicates current infection. Um, these are not antibody tests, which indicate past infection. So most of the tests that we're hearing about are current infections. And they're used to calculate the percentage of positive people, which is one indicator of how much transmission there is in the community. Presently in Massachusetts, roughly 10% of the tests that are done um, are positive, and this number has been going down. So this is all good news, and these are valuable tests, but determining who gets a test and um, whether or not uh, they're useful is, is not so straightforward. Um, and here's the challenge. Um, it's, it's really a question of who gets the test. That's what it boils down to. The tests we now believe are, are reliable and will show people who are positive. But you could ask this, uh, which, people, which people get the tests? Are they only people with symptoms, for example? So that, that would be one group that we would be testing and get a percentage on. Are they only people or mostly people with high risk, pre-existing conditions or nursing home people or shelters, or there, there are lots of different uh, categories? Can anyone get a test? So if tests are done on anyone, or on everyone who wants a test, then this will change the denominator. The percentage is based on 
the number of positives per total number of tests. Mm -hmm. So as more tests become available, in general, this means more uninfected people will be tested. So that percentage of positives will go down. And one of the challenges that epidemiologists face then is to compare these trends over time. As the proportion declines, there's strong suggestion that there's less transmission, which is good. And that's the case in Massachusetts right now. Uh, new infections are going down and there's evidence to support that from testing. But it's difficult to be more accurate than, than to say something along those lines. And so it's the reason why um, the reopening criteria include test positivity rates declining in Massachusetts. The next question is, I understand why a test for the virus is important because it indicates who is currently infected and infectious. But why is the number of people who test positive for antibodies so important? So the antibody test is uh, one that reflects the proportion of people in a population who are immune, who, who were previously infected okay. by the SARS-CoV-2 virus and are now immune. So it's an antibody test. So remember that as the more people become immune, the fewer people there are to become newly infected. And this is good as well. Increased immunity in the population means decreased number of new possible infections. Basically, eventually the virus runs out of people to infect. And many of you have heard the term herd immunity and this herd, herd immunity threshold is what we're trying to achieve where there are so few people on average who are susceptible, who do not have antibodies that um, transmission will cease. We're really far from that in Massachusetts or basically anywhere in the US so far, but it is a metric that's being used and being monitored um, and one that could become important in the future. At the individual level, it may mean that you are not at risk if you test antibody positive. You're not at risk for becoming infected again. There's still a lot that we need to learn about this though. And um, we need to know, for example, whether or not detectable antibodies are really protective uh, and if so, for how long are they protected? For, for months or for years? And we won't be able to know this until people who have been infected can be followed prospectively for, uh, for months or years. Next question is, I heard that people in Korea who had, who had confirmed COVID-19 and tested negative for the virus after being cured, after uh, no longer having symptoms, recently tested positive again. But now I hear that this was a testing error. What's the scoop? So for this, this problem, um, remember that this test looks for evidence of the virus, either RNA, the uh, genetic material, sometimes the uh, PCR test is used for that, or pieces of the virus protein. This is the antigen that some of you have heard about. These are sensitive tests and they can detect very small quantities of either uh, the RNA or the protein. So after the virus is eliminated from the body, sometimes molecules of either can remain in the blood for some period of time. They're not harmful. They're just uh, by, byproducts of the destruction of the virus. Eventually they'll disappear. But if the testing is very sensitive, um, they can be detected by that test and this is what happened in Korea. There was a positive result of the test after uh, past infection, but with retesting, it was shown that this is not viable virus. So it's impossible to transmit to anyone. Essentially, it was the false positive result. So this is good news, and it suggests that antibody uh, production will clear the virus and that there's no persistent or chronic infection from this particular virus. Um, it's still not giving us evidence for how long you're protected, but at least you cannot apparently be uh, reinfected quickly and become infectious again. Finally, 
can you explain why the six indicators for reopening Massachusetts were chosen? What makes them important? So the six indicators are as follows. First of all, the coronavirus positive test rate. This needs to be going down. And I think it's obvious why that would be um, uh, an indicator that we would want to consider. The fewer uh, new infections are detected, the, the proportion of new infections in the test, tests that are done indicates that there's a decline in transmission. Secondly, the number of deaths per day. Remember, there's a time lag from infection to people passing away. But nevertheless, as this declines, it confirms that there's been a past de decline in infection and, and in severe cases. So this has to be also declining. The number of hospitalized COVID-19 patients, this is the third um, indicator for reopening. And in some ways it's similar to deaths, but it also indicates the burden that hospitals are experiencing. So planning can be uh, done accordingly. The fourth indicator is the health systems, health care systems readiness. And basically this is a, an issue of whether or not we can handle resurgence should it occur. The fifth is the testing capacity. Um, and again, this is uh, being able to test a large number of people should a, a, a rebound, should a recurrence uh, take place. And it will also help us to know when we have an antibody test who has been protected. So this can uh, help at an individual level perhaps to determine who can go back to work. And finally, the sixth uh, is contact tracing capacity or capabilities. Um, and this is really important because it allows in the event of fewer and fewer cases uh, producing nevertheless local outbreaks, contact tracing will allow us to move in quickly and try to reduce new contacts, basically nipping that in the butt. So two days ago, the um, announcement of these six indicators indicated, showed, sh showed that the status for positive tests and for testing capacity was in the positive trend. So that's a good sign. And then the other four, number of individuals who died, number of patients, uh, healthcare system readiness and contact tracing, these are all in progress. So the good news is uh, there's a very clear uh, and, and uh, thoughtful uh, set of uh, conditions that are needed to be met for opening the reopening to take place and to persist, and we're moving in the right direction. So let me stop there and um, any, any questions that might arise during the course of the next uh, uh, discussion, I'd be happy to answer later. Thank you. Thank you. And that is Dr. Mark Wilson. He is Professor Emeritus, University of Michigan School of Public Health and Department of Epidemiology. And he'll be here with the other participants in our panel to answer your questions at PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. At this time, we welcome back Michael Jackman. He is a staff member of Congressman Bill Keating's office. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Steve, and thanks to PAC TV for uh, holding these events. Uh, very informative. I always, always like to hear from Dr. Wilson. He's got a great uh, perspective and great information for folks about, um, you know, the course of the uh, pandemic and especially testing. And I'm glad he mentioned testing because I want to talk a little bit about what's going on with, on the federal level with testing. Uh, you know the last few weeks I've come on and I've talked a lot about the economic aspects of the CARES Act and the, the other relief acts that Congress has passed and the president has signed into law. But um, we got an announcement this week that I thought was uh, relevant, especially given the, the uh, emphasis on testing. Um, the Health and Human Services uh, Department un under, the care, under the federal government um, through the CARES Act and the other relief bills that have been passed, is um, you know giving out uh, 10.2 million billion dollars for testing to states, local territories, tribes, and uh, Massachusetts will be receiving 403 million dollars total for uh, testing um, supplies, testing capacity um, to you know, perform the actual test. There's a cost associated with all these things. 
Um, we have already announced that uh, over $2.4 million of that has been released to the community health centers, including Harbor Health Center, which is right located right in Plymouth. So the, the community health centers are a big part of the testing. Obviously, the hospitals will be receiving some funding. Um, it is important that these resources get out to the, the entities that are doing the testing um, so that they can expand it, as Dr. Wilson mentioned. Um, you know, the, the more testing we do and the more asymptomatic people that get tested, the better we'll know what the course of the uh, outbreak is. And um, as we transition to reopening the economy and businesses and um, to summer activities, recreational activities, it'll give a better idea of uh, what the strategies are to do that in the safest way possible. So I did want to mention that just briefly. Um, the other thing, uh, one, getting back to some of the financial aspects of the relief, I have mentioned in, in the past about the economic impact payments, and uh, those are going out uh, slowly but steadily. I think they're into the paper check phase now, and um, also some of those are being issued uh, as uh, debit cards, which um, is uh, can be a good or a bad thing. And I think Heather might mention that, talk a little bit about that. But one thing I want to mention is that folks who have not yet received their payment, um, we had mentioned that there's a portal on the irs.gov website, but there also is an 800 number that folks can call. It's an automated number, so it might take a little time to get through to talk to an actual port person, but I'm told that if you stick with it and listen through a bunch of prompts, you will be able to talk to a real live person and they can uh, find out the status of your uh, economic impact payment. And uh, that number is 1-800-919-9835. So if anyone uh, has a question about that, they can call us right here in the Plymouth office. I'll give that number to 508-746-9000. And um, we are working to to try to get the information about the economic impact payments. Um, I think I mentioned last week, and I know Heather has referred to it too, the uh, IRS is uh, working in a limited capacity uh, during tax season, unfortunately. If you have not filed your taxes yet, I would strongly urge you to file your taxes electronically. Paper returns are not being reviewed at this time. The Andover Service Center, along with Many other service centers across the country are not open because of the, um, the quarantine and the stay-at-home orders that are slowly but surely being lifted. So the IRS is not really giving any indication about the timeline, but they are strongly urging folks to file electronically, if at all possible. Um, and if you did file electronically and you're having issues getting your re re refund or a response, you can let our office know the Taxpayer Advocate Services is a sort of a separate but uh, included under the IRS, but they've been very responsive to us and uh, responding to individual concerns like that. So those are the only two things I wanted to mention. And uh, again, thank you. And I look forward to any questions folks might have. Bill Jackman, and he is with Congressman Bill Keating's office. This time we're going to go to Heather Cosby, and she is a Plymouth CPA. Welcome, Heather. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, PAC TV. Good to be back again. Um, I was, I am going to just spend a moment on the uh, stimulus payments because, for the most part, those programs, along with unemployment, are in full swing, and people, taxpayers, are receiving their benefits, and uh, that seems to be moving forward. I haven't heard a lot from clients or other people this week. Uh, my understanding is there's approximately 10 million stimulus payments that have not gone out yet. Those were scheduled to be as checks, but for some reason of the 10 million, the IRS has indicated that there will be 4 million going out on prepaid um, debit cards, prepaid credit cards, or deb I guess debit cards. My understanding is you can access the funds on those debit cards without fees. So you could take out for cash, you can move the money into your bank account. Um, there has been absolutely no rationale given as to why this is happening or who of the 10 million, whether it's a certain AGI limit, there's been no information given other than it's happening. So uh, as far as I know, other than attempting to call the IRS and find out which way your money's coming, um, you're just gonna have to sit back and continue to wait and see what comes in the mail. 
Uh, my understanding is the IRS has rehired or is in the process of rehiring approximately 3,500 of their staff members to man the phones to start answering these questions that Mr. Jackman mentioned, uh, that now you can call the IRS because previously the IRS was not accepting uh, calls as far as any, any human contact. So that, uh, that is going to be ramping up this week as well. Um, the, uh, so for personal taxes, that's basically it. Just another reminder, your taxes are due July 15th. Your first and second quarter 2020 estimated taxes are also all due July 15th for federal and state purposes. Um, moving on to one of my, my hopes is that a Senate bill uh, is 3612, gets fixed, fixes the PPP loan issue as far as the taxability. Um, that is still in committee. It has not moved. It's not been mentioned recently in the news. It is a bipartisan bill, and uh, I'm hoping that there's something brought to attention on that. I know that the Treasury Secretary has spoken about being flexible and things like that, but I just think there's too much other uh, movement on this HEROES bill and other things going on that it's kind of just stalled. So I will continue to track it because it is very important for businesses to understand how that is how that PPP loan and the expenses related to it are going to be treated on your tax return. Um, so moving on to the big news since last week, uh, SBA issued their uh, debt forgiveness, the loan forgiveness application and instructions on their website. And I did provide Julie with a link to that. The application for debt forgiveness and its instructions is I think 11 pages. It's very detailed. And uh, there have not been a lot of frequently asked questions it, uh, come out from SBA dealing with some of the, the potential issues. I see that the form is up right there. You're going to want to go to SBA.gov, print this out, and start to read through it. Because it does provide a couple new, and for me, new information that I thought was clarifying. And I want to highlight a few of those. Um, when it comes down to the covered period, that's the eight weeks of time you have to spend your money as a business. There is one small adjustment to that that's called an alternative covered period. So basically, you, it starts your eight-week period starts the day the funds hit your bank account, or the alternate period is it starts the first pay period after you receive your funds. Basically, if you get your funds on a Wednesday and then you spend the week rehiring your employees, and your new pay period starts the following Monday, you can start your eight week period that Monday and go eight weeks from that point. It's a very small adjustment, but it could be a very important adjustment for those businesses that furloughed almost all their employees and spent a few days getting them back on track and back, in, back to work and paid. So that's all that's covered on page one of the form. The other really interesting item that I didn't I didn't cue on before that I really want to bring to attention because it makes a big difference. When you talk about the they're called eligible non payroll costs. So there's this concept that if you've got a $10,000 loan PPP loan, at least 7500 or more has to be spent on payroll and 2500 or 25% can be on these other expenses that they've outlined and they talk about them as being rent and utilities and mortgage payments. But really specifically, it talks about leases for real property and personal property. And a lot of people may not understand the difference between those items, so I wanted to make it really clear. Rent for real property would be rent for your office. Real property is real estate, things affixed to the ground. Personal property is everything else. So the things that business owners will want to key in on that you might not have thought of are going to be things like copier leases, equipment leases, computer leases, um, car leases in the name of the company. Those are other types of leases that are going to qualify as an expense that can be paid with these funds and be forgiven. So, um, and they're, they're, the leases have to have been in place prior to February 15th, regardless of what type of lease it is. So they're basically saying, don't go out and get, you can't go out and get new late leases just to spend this money. But if you had leases and you are maintaining those leases during this period, you may use, have that money count towards your debt forgiveness calculation. So I know for a lot of businesses, particularly any that are heavy in construction, um, though, that you may have a significant uh, adjustment to how you do your calculation and make, and if you were worried about coming up with enough expenses, uh, you, you might be able to now when you consider that. The other item it does clarify in utilities is utilities is everything. It's everything to run the office. It's heat, electricity, gas, telephone, internet, 
all of those different types of um, utilities that we all think of as, as you know, well, what is internet a utility or not? They, they did, did define that as being a utility. So, so that application is there. It goes through some of the documentation that you're going to want to put together to support it. The application will be submitted to your bank. Your bank will review it and your bank will be uh, the party that will submit it to SBA. And then SBA will provide uh, their approval or they may come back with questions and you may have to clarify certain items. What SBA has made really clear is they're gonna be really focusing on businesses who receive more than $2 million. They're gonna be scrutinizing to the point where I almost call it an audit. I don't know if it's technically an audit, but they, they're going to be scrutinizing uh, loans and how those use of loans, whether or not the business qualified to even get the loan in the first place um, for those larger loans. So, which I think is great because most small businesses would all, all qualify in saying that we have no idea what was going to happen. So of course we needed the money and we didn't know where else we we're gonna get it because the world is basically ending. So, um, so that, that's good on, on that piece. I, I want to also highlight one other document that I also sent to Julie. It's a document issued by the AICPA and uh, the, it's a PPP loan forgiveness for employers. What this document does is the AICPA, which is the American Institute for Certified Public Accountants, they put together a step-by-step -step process of what, how you need to start to document the expenses for doing your forgiveness calculation. So it goes through and it says payroll costs. And it talks about which types of payroll costs will qualify. Uh, it talks about the rent and utilities. And in step two, it says, okay, now you're going to calculate the forgiveness floor. So it, it, it's, it, this in conjunction with the document issued by SBA will hopefully give most businesses what they need to get most of this work done themselves and feel confident that they're doing it correctly. Um, so that document's about four pages long. I thought it was very useful. We're using it internally in our office amongst ourselves to counsel our clients. Yeah. So that is that piece. I want to just move to, um, well, one more thing. SBA did issue uh, updated frequently asked questions, but it only had a few items that had nothing to do with the debt forgiveness. As this week moves forward in the next two weeks, I expect SBA to be dealing with many questions regarding debt forgiveness and updating those frequently asked questions. You'll want to continue to, ch to check in on that document on SBA's website uh, to see if, what kind of clarifying information they can provide for everybody going through this process. The other big movement, I, even for myself that I saw and a lot of businesses that I work with was out of the blue, an email came from SBA regarding the economic injury disaster loan. These were the first loans that could be applied for directly on SBA's website. And then we didn't hear anything. And then people maybe got uh, an advance of up to $10,000 dropped into their bank account with nothing provided from SBA. What SBA has now been issuing this last week has been the actual loan documents, the approval. They determine the amount you could be approved for this loan. They, uh, they send you an email and basically ask you to certify a few things, read through the document, and then you, you have another loan at your fingertips. So the real question for businesses to understand is whether or not they should take both loans. This is a PPP loan and an economic injury disaster loan. Um, it, it's, it's a little tricky. It's too much for the show. I just want to highlight it as an issue that you need to look through. What I will tell you is that a lot of our businesses are seasonal, meaning a lot of businesses in Plymouth go through the winter using a line of credit to fund their operations until their season opens up. Because the season hasn't opened up, it's a real possibility that a lot of businesses are carrying debt that started at the beginning of this pandemic that they had planned to pay off when their business opened. The economic injury disaster loan would be able to be used to pay those trade payables. And that is very important because that means you're not double dipping what you're using a loan for between PPP and economic injury disaster loan. You cannot use the, the payroll costs against both loans. So you wanna be very specific about how you would use the EIDL loan. And so if the money comes in and you turn around and pay off a line of credit, a credit card, something that is a trade payable that was in existence at the beginning of this pandemic, you will be able to benefit from both loans and receive the debt forgiveness under the PPP loan. That's the biggest concept I wanted to start to have small businesses in our community uh, to look at and understand as they see this information coming to them fast from SBA and needing to make decisions. So 
that's that's my update. It gets a little more exciting each week, it seems like, when I expect it to calm down. But back to you, Steve. Thank you, and that's Heather Cosby, and she is a CPA in Plymouth. She's available to answer your questions. Send them to us at PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. We're delighted each day to have officials and experts joining us to be able to provide very specific, verifiable, accurate information for all of our viewers. And at this time, we're going to go to our business segment with Amy Naples, Executive Director, Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, Amy. Hi, Steve. Great to see you all. Such great information from our panelists. Heather, you continue to blow me away week after week. The information you're providing our businesses is so helpful. So I'm so appreciative of all that you are doing for them. Um, as the governor has released its reopening plan, we've been receiving a lot of questions and calls regarding the phases. Um, I'm sure the Plymouth Area Chamber is working one-on-one -on -one with our small businesses. We have been holding meetups with each industry to decipher their phase, working in planning and providing resources to which they comply and make their reopening smoother. So we have compiled a list um, of local businesses that will have rec the required PPE and sanitation supplies to get them going in um, complying with that. Um, and obviously those are all local vendors um, as we are trying to support our local businesses. One common thread among all of the industries that serve the public is their concerns for customers not wearing masks or keeping in compliance and how that will be enforced. So it's important for our entire community to be on the same page for two reasons, of course, for the public health of our community. And also because businesses need to enforce these rules properly. The task force, the Plymouth Recovery Task Force that we have, will be working on necessary materials and proper signage for each business in town because we cannot have one business allowing something and another business not. So we all need to be on the same page. Um, everyone's going to be required to follow the guidelines for the specific type of business per the governor's plans. And customers also need to follow the certain guidelines as well. And this is just going to assist with our reopening the common economy and keeping it open. So we're asking for your support with that. Um, the task force is working on plans for each industry, identifying the hurdles and finding solutions. We know each industry is very unique and different, and that's why it's so important for us to work with you one-on-one -on -one for a successful reopening. I do encourage all businesses to download and review Baker's reopening plan um, and the requirements by visiting maps.gov forward slash reopening. In addition, there are a number of items businesses must do to outline how its workplace will comply, in, um, including completing a control plan template, posting compliance posters for both employer and work, worker posters. And all of those items can also be found at mass.gov forward slash reopening. Um, again, the chamber is here to support businesses in every possible way. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. I know it's challenging to decipher it all, but we are here for your support. And I know um, our entire community truly is. We want to see our businesses reopen, but of course, in a safe manner. So please don't hesitate to reach out. You can find all of the important information on our website, PlymouthChamber.com, and also by following us on Facebook. And that's our business update for today. Thank you. And that's Amy Naples, Executive Director of Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. Again, good suggestions for all of us and all of our viewers. I would just add to reinforce what she said. Uh, this morning, a client uh, was speaking with me. He was dropping off some documents, and he asked whether he needed to wear a mask. And of course, for those of us that are dealing with this on a daily basis as part of our update, as well as those of us that have gone to ma.gov slash reopening, uh, we're familiar, but we got to remember many other people still need to be reminded and they still need to have uh, the rules explained to them. And here to help explain today, uh, Plymouth Representative Matthew Miratori. Welcome, Matt. Hey, Steve. How are you doing today? Uh, good afternoon to all the panelists. Uh, another great uh, informative show. We really appreciate that. And you're right, Steve. Uh, a lot of people still not realizing you know, what's happening, and uh, we do need to remind people wearing masks everywhere they go. And it, it, it seems to be that people are doing that. I think a good majority of the people are. Uh, and I think people are starting to get this. The wearing of the mask is something that protects others more than it protects you uh, because you don't know if, you if you're asymptomatic and you could have the virus yourself and pass it along to somebody else. So 
Right now, I think it's more common courtesy that we wear masks to protect others, uh, and including ourselves, but really for others. So uh, that is that's the good message that really needs to continue to uh, to get out. We did have a question uh, yesterday that when the beach opens up on Monday, how do we wear a mask on the beach as well? Well, you don't have to wear the mask on the beach. You wear it when you get to the beach and once you settle and you're you're at least six feet to, if more apart from your next party, then you can take the mask off. But if you walk to the water, you've got to put the mask back on. So uh, another question we got the other day was about restaurants when we can go back into restaurants. Well, how can we wear a mask if we're in the restaurant? How do we eat? Well, the same thing. You obviously, you walk into the restaurant with the mask on, you get seated, and once you're settled and ready to drink and eat, you can take the mask off, off to eat and drink. Your server will have a mask, uh, mask on and will continue to have that on. So uh, I, I think it's a little bit of getting used to for people, but you know, we will be getting there. Um, uh, Dr. Wilson talked about the, uh, the, the testing that has been done and the matrix numbers are looking really good. Uh, just just from yesterday alone, there were another seven there were another seven thousand seven hundred forty one tests from the day before, uh, and uh, it was eight hundred seventy three tested positive. So it's eleven point three percent. So that was down. The the deaths were up a little bit more to uh, almost six thousand uh, to five thousand nine thirty eight. Hospitalizations are are the hospitalization rate is below uh, is right at three percent a little bit a little bit below three percent right now. So. Uh, a week ago, uh, this time we were at uh, there were three thousand one hundred twenty-seven folks in the, in the hospitals in Massachusetts with the coronavirus, and today we have two thousand four seventy-two. So that number is drastically dropping. And the ACU was at eight hundred eighteen patients in in ICUs and throughout the Commonwealth this uh, a week ago today, and we're now down to six seventy-two. So the numbers are are in the right direction, uh, as Chris Smalley said yesterday. There's still a little bit of surge here in Plymouth at the Plymouth BID hospital. Um, they're still running about 76 uh, COVID patients, whether suspected or confirmed cases, and 11 in the ICU. Um, but it's, it's holding steady. The um, Plymouth County, um, again, the numbers are going down in small amounts. The, uh, the total cases in Plymouth County are, are almost at uh, seven, a little over 7,100, 7,108. Uh, an increase of 59 from the day before. So it's, it's going up just a little bit of confirmed cases. Uh, the death toll only went up by six. I shouldn't say only went up by six, uh, but it has been in double digits uh, in the past. So at least we're seeing a single digit uh, in uh, Plymouth County. And in Plymouth, uh, the numbers are, are slightly up, not much. Uh, we're up to 397 confirmed cases uh, and 24 deaths in the town of Plymouth. So uh, we are looking uh, in the right direction for all these matrix. Uh, uh, as uh, Stephen Cole mentioned yesterday, it's, it's, it's sort of like shoots and ladders. We need to be sure that we are not, uh, uh, we're not playing shoots and ladders. We need to make sure these numbers continue to stay down uh, because if they go back up, we're gonna go back to where we were a week ago. So we all need to be vigilant with wearing the mask and the protective equipment and disinfecting. With regard to long-term care facilities, um, and I think Bob Einstein will be on the show tomorrow. We'll talk a little bit more about this, um, but uh, we have uh, tested um, several hundred nursing homes so far. Uh, we're not quite there getting all nursing homes done yet. There's been 429 out of the 680 nursing homes that have been tested, uh, the residents and staff. The goal is to get all residents and staff in long-term care facilities tested by May 25th. Uh, so they're working diligently uh, to do that. Uh, there have been out of the 45,000 cases, uh, sorry, 45,000 folks tested in long-term care facilities, a um, little over 18,500 have tested positive. And of course, the deaths, uh, the majority of the deaths keep coming out of long-term care facilities. Facilities, uh, We're now up to 3,617 or 61% of all deaths have occurred in long-term care facilities. So if that doesn't tell you that you need to still continue to wear masks, we are still seeing seniors dying in long-term care facilities and these folks don't go out in public. So they're still getting it somehow. So we still need to be very uh, vigilant in, in wearing the mask. A um, um, couple other things that, uh, that Amy was, was talking about. There are some um, at the mass.gov uh, forward slash reopening uh, website. Uh, there are, uh, there's a section there that that's called uh, purchase, um, a hygienic or protective supplies for your workplace. Yep. I would suggest people to, to actually go on that. It talks about um, what supplies your business will need to do, you'll need um, and how and where to purchase some of these supplies. Uh, a lot, we're getting a lot of calls saying, I don't know where to get these supplies, where do I go? 
So this is a this is a good uh, part of this uh, reopening website that folks want to look at. Uh, the second one on this website has to do with uh, submitting questions and comments. Um, we, we're getting comments from some businesses that are not sure where they fit. We had one yesterday, Steve, that was a yoga studio. Um, the, the plantation uh, was looking to see where they fit. Um, we're getting a lot of calls like this. And if you can submit your questions and our comments about your reopening uh, and where you seem to fit, it's a very simple form that, that Julie has up there now. You go through it, put your information, ask your questions, uh, and you'll get you'll get responses back right away. They'll, they'll give you some guidance on that. And the third part of this reopening plan that is useful for folks is uh, uh, is when can I open my business, um, and uh, what what sort of detailed plan do I actually need to provide, and the phases of opening. Uh, so this is another good place actually for folks that have businesses where to go to find that information. Um, and I think I think Amy mentioned about compliance um, and, you know, what if somebody's not uh, in compliance, they come to the store, they come to the restaurant. Uh, again, we all need to self-police this. There aren't going to be police that are going to come to uh, to a place to arrest people to do this. Uh, but if you, you know, the, these are um, the reopening, the mass.gov reopening, there is a place there where you can actually, you know, submit something if you want to say, hey, we were at this restaurant or this or this store and, you know, we notice people weren't wearing masks and it will be investigated, they'll be contacted, et cetera. So, so there is uh, opportunities to give information about uh, those who aren't being in compliance. And, um, and uh, also um, there is, um, AAA is now open as of today. Uh, many of the AAA locations are open and um, uh, for RMV service, registry motor vehicle services by appointment only. So um, I don't know if the one in Plymouth is, I think it is, uh, but if you have, some RMV uh, things to do that uh, you've been holding off on. Uh, you may want to contact them uh, for for an appointment. And um, the last thing, Steve, um, you had a you had somebody ask yesterday about um, where to find Clorox wipes, and I had somebody that um, a good friend of ours actually that actually emailed instructions on how to how to make Clorox wipes. Uh, and it was, it was kind of, it's actually very simple. It was, it was a cup of water, two teaspoons of bleach, two teaspoons of liquid dishwashing detergent, not dishwasher detergent, but dishwashing detergent, and one teaspoon of essential oils. And you pour it into a spray bottle and you put it onto a paper towel and voila, you have, uh, you have a Clorox wipe. Um, and people have been using this uh, for quite some time since we started with this. So, um, so there you go. You, you, this is why we do this show and, to get answers back to people. So so that's my update uh, for today, Steve. Back to you. Thank you, Matt. And we have a lot of questions today, so hopefully we'll have more answers. Uh, thanks to all our panel. Uh, please continue to email your questions to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. Again, before we go to our questions, just want to remind viewers that tomorrow, uh, Matt, Ken, and I will be joined by uh, Dr. Philip Trifletti. He is an attending primary care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess also, Robert Eisenstein, he's a senior living consultant. Our business portion tomorrow will be with Stephen Cole, the executive director of Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. But right now, we're going to go to our health component with a question for Dr. Mark Wilson. Uh, Mark, this question has to do with masks. And Mary writes that the husband of my friend has Alzheimer's. And so he refuses to wear a mask. And she understands that people with certain issues uh, may not be required to wear one. Uh, as, it does, as it happens, the friend does not take her husband into stores, uh, but rather uh, Mary parks <coughs> next to the friend, and then she locks them in, in the car. But would he be able to go to stores given his Alzheimer's condition? Dr. Wilson. This is a complicated situation. Um, and let's remember that the primary use of the masks that we uh, carry around is to prevent us from infecting other people rather than from uh, others infecting us. And so um, it's complicated by, by not knowing whether or not this person is infectious. You would worry less if you knew that. Um, and as with anything, the balance here is 
um, someone's psyche. Uh, it includes uh, how comfortable they feel in different settings and so forth. I'm not a uh, psychologist, so I don't feel well equipped to answer this question. But, but more more broadly, I think um, encouraging people to wear masks, perhaps uh, in this context, by treating it as as perhaps even a game or or as as a as some other uh, reason to uh, protect others um, might be an approach. Um, and I, I really don't know uh, what the proper procedure should be here, except if the establishment determines that that person cannot come in, in which case uh, there's nothing that they can do about that. I would discourage that person from going out, even though um, going out into a, a context where they'd be in close contact, even though uh, they may not be putting others at risk. We don't know that. Thank you, this is Dr. Mark Wilson. We're also gonna to go to Representative Matthew Miratori for further comment on the masks question. Representative Miratori. Yeah, I think, doc, yeah, thanks Steve. Dr. Wilson is correct. I mean, if, if, um, if they can't wear a mask, uh, they really should try to stay home and not, not go out. But just to clarify too, uh, the governor's order uh, still indicates anyone over the age of 65 to stay home. So I, I think some of this is, sometimes this is getting lost in this, but, the age group, uh, and, and we've mentioned on this show, that are, that are dying from this, 95% uh, are over the age of 60. Um, so the, they're, there's still an order for anyone over 65 to stay home unless you have to go to a grocery store or you have to go to a pharmacy. But other than that, uh, stay home. Thank you. That's Plymouth Representative Matthew Muratori. Now, the next question that we're going to go to is uh, to Kenneth Tavares. He's chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen. Uh, Ken you initially indicated in your opening remarks that uh, there was an election yesterday and that the results were that uh, Susan Moran was elected the state uh, senator for uh, the town of Plymouth. And a viewer asked, do we have the actual results in from that election? Uh, yes and no. Uh, earlier this morning, I had a conversation with the town clerk and these are uh, unofficial results with uh, some additional ballots still being counted. And at that time, uh, Susan Moran had received uh, 2,875 votes from the town of Plymouth, and Mr. McMahon had received 2,575. I asked him if well, we would have the final results by the end of the day, and he said probably more likely it will be uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you. And that's Kenneth Tavares. He's the chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen. We're going to go to Heather Cosby, our Plymouth CPA. And the question is from Karen, and it has to do with stimulus checks. And Karen writes, I have already filed my taxes and have given them my bank information for direct deposit. The rest of my family has received their checks via mail. I was under the impression that if I had given them bank information, I would receive my money now. Should I be concerned that I've not yet received them? It's going to depend on when you filed them. So the IRS's computer system is not, I would call, real time, meaning their system has to almost have batch updates. So if you filed your return in the last couple of weeks or even last month, that may not be enough time for the IRS to take that banking information and process it through their systems into the system that's doing the stimulus payments. So my recommendation would be to go to the irs.gov website, click on the get my payment link and see what, it, what information the IRS has for your specific situation. In the big picture, I'm just not worried about anybody getting their payment missed because there's going to be a process for the payment to be reconciled on your 2020 tax return. Heather Cosby, Plymouth CPA, answering viewers' question. We're now gonna to go to Michael Jackman and Michael, uh, we have a question from Bill, and Bill writes that Heather has stressed that the new bill pending in Congress must be passed very soon or all the items paid by the PPP monies will be taxable, which undercuts the whole idea of PPP. Is the Massachusetts delegation in favor of this bill, and specifically, what is being done to push it, including action by Congressman Keating? Great, th great question. Uh, I would defer to Heather in terms of the timing of when the bill needs to be passed, but I would definitely say, well, I'd say a few things. It's a Senate bill, and as Heather mentioned, it is still in committee, uh, so it needs to be acted on by the Senate first. Um, 
But, uh, and also, as Heather alluded to, Secretary Mnuchin has mentioned this as a concern. Um, there will be other bills and, and there will be other packages, if you will. The House did pass another package last week that the Senate and the and their administration have indicated they would not favor. Um, so, but, but I don't think that's the end of the story for either additional relief or for provisions like this um, tax uh, forgiveness or, or tax write-off that Heather's referring to. Um, I, would, I, would just, I would say it's very important that people be in touch with their delegation, their member of Congress here in Plymouth, that's Congressman Keating, the two U.S. Senators, Senator Warren and Senator Markey, if they support this bill, if they think this is something that should be passed by Congress. Heather's doing a great job advocating for it and letting me know and the Congressman know how important it is. But it's important to hear from other folks, too, because there will be other packages. There will be other um, pieces of legislation addressing the coronavirus um, situation, health-wise, economic-wise. So it's important that people voice their concerns and let us know that this is something that's important. We're getting the message, but um, we need to have, um, you know, have people uh, send that message to us as loud as they can and to all their elected officials. Thank you, Michael Jackman, Congressman Keating's office. We're going to go to Amy Naples for our business uh, question. Uh, Amy, a viewer writes, as Massachusetts opens and reopens and as we begin to travel outside of Plymouth, um, are the chambers of commerce throughout the state uh, communicating with one another? And might we expect to enter and receive, be received by businesses in other communities the same way that we are being received in Plymouth? Yes, so we actually communicate very frequently with our colleagues at the other chambers. There is a collaboration of Chambers of Commerce executives called MACE, Massachusetts Executive Chamber of Commerce. And we talk all the time, we share best practices and we're always communicating. So everybody would re receive a warm welcome, um, certainly. In our surrounding areas, I know Marie Oliva has been on the show before, Wendy Northcross on the Cape, and Peter Foreman on, of the South Shore Chamber. We are in constant communication. So certainly you would receive um, a, wel a welcome from them. Uh, next question, thank you, Amy Naples, is going to go to uh, Representative Muratori. And this is a variation of a question that we've received in the past. It has to do with bottles. Uh, when will we be able to return our bottles and cans? And if we can't return them, shouldn't the Commonwealth of Massachusetts stop collecting the five cents, at least temporarily? Yes. <laughs> That's my short answer. If we're not going to be collecting, we should stop the five cents. Uh, as, the, as for the first part of the question, I, I don't... I don't see any time in the near future where we could actually return these cans. Um, nothing has been brought up yet um, on, on Beacon Hill about this. Um, uh, but I, I think I've said this on this show personally. I, I just, I don't feel comfortable bringing these cans back. I was saving them for some point until some point until I realized I'm just going to put them in my own recycling and let the trash people take it away. Um, but um, it is something that's being talked about, about, you know, at least um, uh, delaying or holding off on paying the five cent deposit at this point. Uh, nothing has, has come out yet, but I'll continue to advocate for that until we can really find a way. Can we actually return these cans and bottles? That was Plymouth Representative Matthew Muratori. A question from Mary. We thank all of our viewers for your questions today. We're now going to go back to the panel and ask each of our participants to give us a closing statement. And at this time, we're going to begin with Dr. Mark Wilson. Dr. Wilson, what do you want viewers to remember today? Uh, I think we should... Keep in mind that we're really fortunate to have a state and a town that are using evidence to decide on reopening. All of us want to see um, our lives head back to some sense of normal, and none of us want to have to return to the restrictions that we've gone through. So continue to follow those recommendations. Use masks where, needed, where appropriate. Continue to hand wash, keep your distances, and so forth. And if we do so, our community will continue to move in the right direction. Dr. Mark Wilson, Professor Emeritus, University of Michigan, School of Public Health, Department of Epidemiology. Thank you. We're going to go to Michael Jackman, Congressman Keating's office. Mike, what's the takeaway today? 
Thank you, Steve. And uh, as I try to do every uh, week, I want to mention the census. This is 2020. We are in the middle of a uh, census collection by the uh, government. We do it every 10 years by the Constitution. It's very important that people respond uh, to the census so that the government has an accurate account of how many people are living in Plymouth, in Plymouth County, in the 9th Congressional District. So when funds and grants and other uh, appropriations are allocated, um, they're allocated to where the people are, the people who need them. Um, I know it's been mentioned, but I want to emphasize that the Plymouth Area League of Women Voters is uh, put a challenge out to the seven towns in its, in its region, including Plymouth, uh, Bourne, Carver, Duxbury, Kingston, Marshfield, Pembroke, and Plimpton to see which town can have the best return, rate of return. And we've had a pretty good uh, rate of return um, from some of those towns, some better than others. And I think it's great that the, the league is doing this to issue this challenge. I know uh, Congressman Keating, if you follow his Facebook page, mentioned the census uh, on his Facebook page within the last day or two. Uh, our rate of return in Mass uh, Ninth District has been lower than the other districts. And he's issuing a, cha issuing a challenge, too, to folks to get online, go to uh, USA Census 2020.gov, and um, try to find, uh, my, maybe it's my census, sorry, my census 2020.gov, and try to find a way to respond to the census. It's so important. Um, if you have questions, you can go to the Plymouth League of Women Voters, PlymouthLWV.org and they can provide information too on how you can uh, respond to the census. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Jackman from Congressman Keating's office. Uh, Heather Cosby, you heard the earlier question regarding the pending legislation. There was a question about timing, which Michael Jackman said you might have further comments. Anything else you'd like to add to our viewers? Sure, on, on that question, uh, I wanna just correct the question. It's not that the proceeds become taxable, it's that the expenses are not deductible. That's the fine difference. The end result is the same, that you will pick up income that's taxed, but that the ex right now the expenses would be considered not deductible and that is the problem and that is the, the correction to the that's been proposed that's in the uh, committee and the Senate. So as far as timing, it really is, um, you know, before before the tax filing season next year, this should be clarified. So we're we're talking, you know, by the end of the year, so that everybody can plan appropriately. If you're a business that got, I don't know, a hundred thousand dollar loan, and you need to know whether or not those expenses are really going to be deductible, which was what everybody was expecting, um, and or are you going to pick up a hundred thousand dollars of extra income because you can't deduct those expenses? That affects what you're going to pay for your estimated taxes. So it is important. It is a little further out planning. You need to be aware of it. I keep talking about it because that to me makes a huge difference in my ability to meet my clients' needs is knowing if how this is going to be resolved. Because if you were to go back and replay any of the original press conferences from the White House, this what has had happened, how the IRS has, has, has interpreted this is not what was presented to the public. And when everybody was going to get their loans, that was not what their expectation was. So that's why it's so important to me. And I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Jackman is very well aware of my, my, my uh, passion for this, uh, but it's really just to make sure that everybody you know, knows what they're doing and paying their taxes accordingly. Uh, as far as just closing, uh, it, you know, another great day of, of information. I appreciate being here. Everybody stay safe. Your businesses are getting ready to reopen. You know, you have the guidelines, but you also have the ability to um, do things more restrictive to the guidelines for your business. So just remember that. I mean, I'll just talk about myself for a second. I could have people in here all the time in my office. We're very restrictive. We're now just only having staff and I was still will not have my clients in yet because I want a little more time. So I'm following the guidelines and I'm choosing to be more restrictive. So businesses, uh, if you can operate and, and operate and function, just remember that too. You don't have to completely open to the public if you don't want to. So be safe and and, you know, do your best this process and do what's best for you and your clients and, and keep everybody safe. Thank you, Heather Cosby. She's the Plymouth CPA. And this is why we do this each day. Her clarifications and her explanations regarding taxation and deductions are helpful, not only to the viewer that asked the question, but to all of us. And at this time, we're going to continue and go to Amy Naples. Amy. 
Just a reminder of the Plymouth One Fund, which is a fund created to help our small businesses in Plymouth. We are still accepting donations on our website at PlymouthChamber.com, and we will have the application for our local businesses to apply as soon as possible. We are just finalizing that, and they can apply for those unrestricted grants. We're very excited to get the money out to the businesses who need it most. So you can visit PlymouthChamber.com to make a donation and to learn more about the Plymouth One Fund. And also my daily plea of to support our local businesses. So when you're spending, support local business and, and shop local. Amy Naples, Executive Director of Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. We're now going to go to Matthew Miratori for his closing statement on the state. Matt. Yeah, thanks, Steve, and thanks to the panelists. Appreciate all that uh, information you've been providing. Uh, again, as I say, always stay informed what's happening. Uh, go to mass.gov forward slash COVID-19 or mass.gov uh, forward slash reopening now uh, to get more information. Uh, if you still have questions to ask on, on uh, anything that's going on with the COVID-19 disease itself, call 211. You can get text alerts. The governor is actually speaking now, so you'll get text alerts at what time the governor speaks every day. Um, you can get text alerts by texting COVID-MA to 888-777 or COVID-MA ESP in Spanish to 888-777. And again, if you have health questions, go to buoy.com forward slash forward slash forward slash mass. Um, stay home if you don't need to. Uh, doesn't mean that because we're reopened, that means everyone can go out everywhere. Uh, if you don't need to go out, don't go out. If you do, be safe when you go out uh, and, and, you know, wear a mask, stay six feet apart, um, you know, and, and stay calm still. Uh, we're, we're still getting through these numbers. We will get through this. Uh, it will be a long time in coming, though. Uh, so wearing of the mask and some of these new norms are going to be going on for months. So uh, so just remember that. And again, the more we come together uh, by staying apart, the, the quicker we'll get back to the people we love and the things we love to do. And again, thanks to all those essential workers out there that are taking care of our physical health and those that are taking our care of our economic health. And we'll talk to you tomorrow, Steve. Thank you, Plymouth Representative Matthew Miratori. And to all of our panel, Dr. Mark Wilson, Michael Jackman, Heather Cosby, Amy Naples, and Ken Tavares, this is your 49th update. And uh, throughout this pandemic, uh, you and your Board of Selectmen have demonstrated a commitment to communicate regularly with the Plymouth community. Is that going to continue? Absolutely. And until we know that this virus has been uh, actually defeated, we will continue to communicate in various ways. And again, I'd like to thank PAC TV for what they've done in making this wonderful opportunity available that all of us uh, united can inform the community uh, about what is happening. I, I think a, a takeaway for today is, is really senses around but there are so many detailed, complex questions that are being asked. There are many rules. There are new protocols to follow. And none of them are easy. Uh, and I just uh, want to acknowledge that and say to folks, even though you may feel overwhelmed by what's going on, just step back once in a while, take a look at it, take a deep breath, and then come, come back into the arena. Our goal is to stop this virus, and we will do it one day at a time, you know, offering our, our, our work, uh, you know, to this. So if you're feeling somewhat tired, it's normal. You, have, you absolutely have a right to. I don't remember any situation where we have had so many complex rules that literally can change by the day. Plymouth, you're doing well. Keep it up. Thank you, Kenneth Tavares, uh, Chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen. And tomorrow we invite you to join Ken, Matt, and me when we will be with the participants, Dr. Philip Trifletti. He's an attending primary care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess, also Robert Eisenstein, Senior Living Consultant, Stephen Cole, Executive Director, Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Steve Trifletti, Plymouth Town Moderator. Good day.